Sorry about the laryngitis. It's not spreadable. It was from a movie. Screaming. So uh, bear with the gravelly voice. Uh, <coughs> carnivorous plants from sunlight to sirloin. I blame out. So I was a little kid, child of the 80s, on May 4th, 1987, when the episode La Cucaracha aired. And if those that don't remember, Alf was a puppet that was uh, from the planet Melmac, and he crash landed, and it was a 80s sitcom where he lived with a family. Hijinks ensued from him being an, an alien. But uh, in this particular episode, a cockroach from his home planet had stowed away on his, uh, on his uh, spaceship, and it grew to giant sizes, and they eventually killed it. But at the very end, they were like, oh, what's this plant? And he goes, oh, it's a Venus flytrap. Oh, where'd you get it? From Venus. <laughs> And it bites the tip off of the pencil. And then that's how the episode ends. And from there, the obsession grew and grew and grew. Uh, until I was a member of two different carnivorous plant societies. So LACPS, Los Angeles Carnivorous Plant Society, and the International Carnivorous Plant Society. And I had delved deep down the rabbit hole. So much so... I built the killing field, which was a, a vivarium of <coughs> varying soil heights. I built a little section in the center so that as I watered everything, it would flush the soil of any toxins, and then I could suck it out of the center with a, a turkey baster. So oh. it kept everything healthy, <clears throat> had a glass top on there for the light and everything. These are all multiple different types of carnivorous plants. And being in my mid-twenties in Los Angeles, uh, you know, I'd walk around, kind of bored in between acting gigs, and we, me and my roommate Dave, we'd have a uh, butterfly net, and we'd walk around uh, the base of the Hollywood Hills there looking for fresh dog poop, because that's where the flies were. And we'd scoop up a bunch of flies, put them in a mason jar, put them in the refrigerator, because when it gets cold, they go into hibernation. And they get slow. And then nightfall would come, being in Los Angeles, and smoke a little pot, have a little wine, mm -hmm. turn the music on, a bunch of roommates would come down, and we would turn on the killing field and get out the jar of flies and dump them in there and close everything up, and they wake up. And they're like, hmm, where am I? And they walk around, and they walk into one of these things, and it would go boom. We all cheer, and then, and then the next one would be woken up and up, and it would fly, and it would land into something sticky and land on the ground. And it can't fly. It was like ah, ah and it tr tries to clean it off. Well, that sticky stuff is actually a neurotoxin, so it was getting stoned, and it was spreading it further. And you'd watch these flies, and they'd be like ah, 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 ah and they'd never walk, and then they'd just stop and zone out for five minutes, and then they'd move, and then they'd land on something else, and it would go, cold, and then we'd all cheer. <laughs> so the obsession went to uh, weird depths, as, all, as it always does. <clears throat> Which brings us to what makes a carnivorous plant carnivorous. By the way, the Savage Garden is kind of the Bible for carnivorous plants, uh, whether you're collecting, you're wanting to learn about it, uh, wanting to know what different types there are out there, and resources. That is a, a fantastic, fantastic book by uh, Peter D. Amato. Um, five things must happen, and all five things have to happen in order for a plant to be considered carnivorous. It's got to capture prey and traps. It's got to kill the captured prey. It's got to digest the captured prey, uh, absorb nutrients for from the digested prey and use those nutrients to grow and develop. Once it meets all those five, it is considered a carnivorous plant. They are located on every single continent except for Antarctica. And like usual, Australia is the danger, danger, danger zone. It is has 187 species of carnivorous plants, the most out of all continents on the planet. 
their habitat is really varied. But one of the big things that kind of ties it all together is their environment is nutrient deficient. Now, they're plants. Just like any plant, they absorb light. Photosynthesis occurs. It creates energy, creates fuel for them. But plants need other sources of energy, usually in the form of um, the soil that they're in, <coughs> the growing medium that they're in, by mycorrhizal fungi breaking down nutrients and then giving it to the plants to the roots. <clears throat> Carnivorous plants live in sphagnum bogs, on the sides of mountains, growing up trees, in riverbeds, uh, in sandy beaches, or in gypsum mountains. <clears throat> and so it really can't draw nutrients from the soil, so it develops a secondary adaptation where it consumes meat in order to get the nutrients that a plant would normally get from the soil. So while it still does photosynthesis for its primary source of energy, its secondary adaptation is consuming living things. <clears throat> they are an endangered species. 25% of the species are at increasing risk of extinction, and the rest of the 75% are not that far off. Uh, things that are kind of contributing to that, of course, you know, the environmental changes that we're all seeing happening. Um, habitat destruction, uh, whether it's taking the wetlands and converting them to housing or shopping malls or parks, etc. Um, you know, clear, clear, clear cutting forests. Um, and also, poaching is a huge thing. Some of these species are super rare. And you'll get a collector that'll go out there and he'll grab them and maybe that's the second to last plant that he just get grabbed and then it goes on the black market. Uh, it used to be a big deal with Venus flytraps, the most common plant that we've all seen as the example for, for carnivorous plants. <clears throat> all the big box chain stores used to get their sources of that plant from poachers. Uh, they'd go down to North Carolina and they would just rip up fields of them, package them, put them on the shelf, and then they'd be dead in a week. Uh, so, but now, thanks to a lot of people like myself and other people that are spreading the words about carnivorous plants, um, they've switched over to more ethically sourced um, ways to get their plants. There are five different ways that carnivorous plants capture their prey. And some of these features are actually in multiple, uh, uh, some of these features can appear in the same plant, different features. Um, so it doesn't just have to be one. There's the snap trap, which we all know, the Venus fly trap. Uh, pitfall traps to the right, uh, which is pit, uh, pitch plant. Bladder traps for uh, utricularia, bladder worts. Fly trap. Um, sticky traps is another term for it. Uh, those are sundews. And then the lobster pot trap, uh, like Valencia. Uh, also, that one is featured in like, Darwin's Antonia and a couple other species. <coughs> and we'll go over some of these mechanisms as they crop up in our examples here. But it's not just for small bugs. A particular plant, uh, Saracenia, the uh, American pitcher plant, has a symbiotic relationship that it's developed with frogs. Um, when I had my carnivorous plant uh, conservatory up in Northern California on my farm, uh, I didn't realize that the mountains of Northern California had tree frogs, but they lived in the dirt, actually. So they were dirt frogs, essentially. And the reason I found that out is because when I brought in Saracenias, I had frogs all over the place. And what they do is, the plant attracts bugs, the frogs will eat some of the bugs, the frogs poop in the pitcher, it gives the pitcher nutrients. Just like any sort of manure gives plants energy. Same thing with that. Larger bugs, like that beautiful butterfly. This was actually taken by myself as a 
Los Angeles Carnivorous Plant Society. It was a big, beautiful draw strip, about this big, just mass of all these tangles. And in the center was this beautiful butterfly, just is quite striking. Uh, to the right here, <coughs> some of the species have actually developed uh, angles on them so that it will bounce the sound back to bats and the bats will come up thinking it's another bat there, they'll land on it and, oop, kind of a theme here, fall along. Uh, larger versions of that pitcher plant. This is Nepenthes marilianella. They have other ones that are even bigger. Uh, this is the owner of carnivorous, uh, California carnivores in Santa Rosa, California. Um, uh, this particular one, they have found rats and uh, small birds in that being digested. <coughs> Uh, Nepenthes raja has developed an interesting feat, once again involving fecal, a fecal feat as, as it were. It um, excretes a fatty substance on the lid which attracts local shrews and rats. And they'll come up and they'll nibble on it because it's fatty and sweet. But it's an almost instant um, not toxin, um, laxative. laxative, thank you, that's the word. And so it'll eat, and within a couple seconds, it'll go right into that trap. And once again, providing an nutrients. And then on the far right, a uh, Venus flytrap large enough to grab uh, a small little toad. So it's not just bugs that these things eat. And on top of that, in 2013, a team in India discovered that um, certain varieties of carnivorous plants, 20, uh, 20 different species, actually emit UV light um, in the blue spectrum in particular. And it's the first time such distinct uh, fluorescent emissions were detected in the plant kingdom. And by distinct, we mean for a very, very specific purpose that is across all of the species, which they believe is to attract bugs. Um, they discovered that ants, when they painted this with a, um, what was it? Um, uh, uh, an acid, they painted the rim with an acetone extract which blocked the UV light. And the plants that they did that on had a magnitude less amount of ants that it trapped over a week. And they repeated this time and time again. So ants are interesting. Speaking of colors from before, ants can't see red. How they figured this out, I don't know. But they can see blue and purple, and they see that extremely vividly. Uh, and so, one of these uh, particular plants, the, uh, this is Saracenia and then the Pethus, they love chowing down on ants. So, it's interesting that blue is the particular one that it uh, shows off. Species, it's over 750 species in total and around 20 different genuses. These are all the genes of uh, carnivorous plants. <clears throat> the ones in particular that we're going to focus on are what I think the coolest ones. Uh, Dionea, Drosera, Nepenthes, Darlington, Darlington Tonia, Saracenia, uh, Utricularia, and Cephalotis. And of course, what carnivorous plants speech would not be complete without a a little shop of horrors reference. <laughs> Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> Dianea, mus, uh, Dianea musca, yeah, that one. <laughs> the Venus flytrap. Uh, Dianea muscipula. Uh, this is a snap trap. 
mechanism. Um, oil switch once again is one of the five traps that carnivorous plants feature. It has triggered hairs, which once it gets triggered, what happens is an electrical impulse is sent to the cells and they take water from inside the cell and shunt it to the outside wall of the cell and it, it closes the trap around the, around the play. And that happens like that. Uh, the trap will close. If the insect is alive, it will continue to struggle and it'll continue to trigger the hairs, which then will tell the plant, aha, I got one. <clears throat> and then it will form a seal and uh, um, release digestive enzymes. Um, Oh yeah, it'll release digestive enzymes, which then dissolves basically the innards and some of the outards of whatever it's caught. And then on the far right, it reopens for more knobs. Uh, <clears throat> it is a leaf. All of these carnivorous plants, they're modified leaves. So just like leaves, they fall, they die. Carnivorous plants, each leaf has only so much energy and only so much digestive enzymes. So they're smart. If these things don't get triggered when it's closed, it goes, I didn't catch something. And then it reopens, it doesn't release the digestive enzymes. One leaf can usually digest one <coughs> to two insects before it dies off and a new leaf replaces it. So it's very careful about what it goes for. Um, and it's done all by this. And we found that it takes and counts. It's the only plant that can count. Because if one of these triggers, errors, gets touched, it doesn't do anything. If two gets touched, it doesn't do anything. Three to five errors, getting touched, it closes on its prey. So that way, water drops or wind tickling it, it goes up, I don't got that, I don't, I don't have to move. But it actually counts, which means it's the only plant that's smarter than my Uncle Lou. <laughs> you count up to five. <clears throat> and here is an example. And that's not sped up, it's that quick. The more sunlight that they get, the faster that trap mechanism goes. If you ever grow them at home and it goes, it's not getting enough sunlight. Hmm. Different types. So many of these um, varietals that are out there are genetic mutations. Rarely are they seed grown. So the vast majority of these are actually clones. That's one of the ways that a lot of these carnivorous plants actually will proliferate is they bifurcate. There's one plant and then it splits into two. Then it splits into four. It also creates seed, but because of the bifurcation, they are easily cloned. So if you get one of these guys that turns into a wacky trap, which was originally called Bart Simpson, but 20th Century Fox didn't like that, so they had to rename it Wacky Traps. Um, you can pop off a couple cells of that, put it in uh, a gel medium, and then it'll create a whole other plant off of that. And, or you can also bury, cut break off a leaf, bury it, and that'll create another plant. So the majority of these are actually clones uh, off of the original mutations. B52, that's one that I grew. Um, not my own variety, but that's a picture of one of mine. Those are exceptionally large. Those are the ones that get the frogs. Um, uh, red Ragoon, this is an all red variety. And then Fused Tooth, that's, that's cool. The, uh, the little teeth are all soldered together, basically. Uh, some of these varietals actually, they, they won't catch anything. Like Wacky Traps, it can't, it, it'll close, but 
bug gets right out of it because of that. So some of these mutations are just for the collectors and the plant geeks that are out there. They're not very friendly to pollinators, are they? Ah, that brings us to our next point. Very good question, <laughs> and aptly uh, timed. <clears throat> the flowers. You see the plant at the bottom? You see the flowers on these very tall stalks? It's because they want to keep their pollinators away from the traps. And they also emit an, a different spectrum of UV light, which will attract the pollinators, versus the UV light that some of these traps will throw off that attracts the bugs that they want to eat. So, um, a lot of the varieties or the genuses of, of carnivorous plants can be tough to germinate the seeds from. Uh, so if you're an at-home grower, um, Dianea, the Venus flytrap, those are super easy. They're, they're, you don't need any special treatment for those. Some of the other ones, um, they'll need a, a period of cold stratification, like put it in the seeds in the refrigerator for you know, a couple weeks to three months, and then pull it out and plant it and cross your fingers that it will uh, hatch. But uh, a nice thing that you can use is gibberellic acid. And gibberellic acid actually shortcuts the uh, cold stratification gene that held within the seed, and it also breaks down the seed coating just a little bit. So you can increase your germination rates through that. What kind of acid did Woody give? Um, gibberellic acid. You can, actually a lot of places that sell carnivorous plants, you can all, I mean, the specialty stores like California Carnivores, they'll also sell gibberellic acid. You can go to Amazon and get it. Um, typically it's used for seed germination. Not just in carnivorous plants, but in other species that have really tough seeds to crack. So, so I can use that instead of like starification and filing it or putting it in boiling water? Yes, yeah, yeah. Filing it is another popular method. They do that with carnivorous plants and seeds too. Uh, they can also do that in conjunction with the gabaralic acid. And it, it, it works even more, but sitting there filing the seeds, it's just Having done that, <clears throat> Drosera, I love these guys. Sundews, uh, uh, the Grecians actually named these guys um, sundews because of the dewy look to it. And when the light hit it, it looks like dew on grass. So the Grecians called them sundews. This is a fly paper mechanism. They have a lot more trigger hairs than the Venus flytrap, and on top of these trigger hairs are little globules of sticky substance, uh, and that also is that neurotoxin that I was telling you about, where the fly was wiping it all around himself, trying to clean it off, but he's just getting himself more stone. That's what that is. So the fly lands on it, wiggles around because he's stuck to it like a flypaper. It's triggering these hairs, and the plant goes, uh -huh. I got one, and it curls up around the fly, releases the digestive enzymes, and then unfurls for more numbs. Did you guys try the uh, neurotoxin to see if it could you stone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> what was the effect? <laughs> for for cross it was it was sharp. It was a little sweet, but it had this sharpness to it. Uh, granted, we're you know huge, bigger we're than huge, a lot bigger than a fry. So didn't do anything. But there's some other uh, carnivorous plants that we'll get to here in a minute. Nepenthes, pitcher plants, they excrete a really sugary substance, and while it's not a neurotoxin. It's, it's sweet like nectar. It's incredible. But I'm not one to put that on the toast. <laughs> <clears throat> different types. This, this is one of those species that there's a lot of different subtypes. Um, Drosa rubinata. Um, this is the one that had the, uh, the butterfly attached to it in the other photo. Uh, Scorpiotis. Um, 
These are considered a pygmy uh, sundew. There's filiformis, long tube-like tendrils, uh, Drosera spatulata, looks like a spatula, and uh, uh, Placia. This is a, um, a pygmy Drosera, and they're about this big, they're tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, and this is a gamene in the center, <clears throat> and these are actually buds. You can break these off and they'll form new plants. So it produces seed, it bifurcates, and it also buds off. Uh, the flowers of Drosera, absolutely beautiful. And once again, on that long stalk, so the pollinators don't get eaten. And it just keeps producing the flowers. These things, if, if you collect them, and they go to seed. Yeah. It's, it's just one seed pod has like 40 seeds in it, and it'll produce like 50 pods. And so you just, after a while, it's like, you know, invasion of the, the triffids. What, what was the 50s horror movie? <clears throat> the pentheids. The uh, pitcher plant. Now, there's two different types of pitcher plants highlands and lowland pitcher plants. And uh, this kind of is what it sounds like. The highlands are higher up in the mountains. The lowlands are in the lower portions of the rainforests. Do they insult each other just like stops? Oh, stops? absolutely. Mm -hmm. They're surly drugs, too. Yeah. yeah. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> it is a pitfall mechanism. So kind of like the video game of the 80s, the same name. These little hairs along the front here, you can see it pretty good there. The ants will climb up it. And along these ridges here are glands that produce that, affectionately we call it nepenthes drool, uh, that sugary substance that I was not putting on toast. Um, <clears throat> and the ants will come up. Oh, no, 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 no. And the way this is angled on the inside, climbs up, eats the mounds, goes over here, whoop, falls in to a vat of digestive enzymes. It's like those cartoons where you know the uh, the villain is in at the Acme factory and there's giant bats and he falls in. And that's the birth of the villain. Well. Uh, we don't get the joker out of this one, we just get digestive bugs. <laughs> but uh, uh, Nepenthes actually have a unique hydrolytic en enzyme that's only found in this species. It's the only place on the planet. Uh, and some of these are so rare that the only um, species of one particular variety will just be found on the side of a hill on one tree, and that's the whole of the species. These guys can be extremely rare, and that's one of the bummers with deforestation that's going on with the rainforest, is we are losing these guys en masse because of that. What is the enzyme for? Digestion. Just like we have digestive enzymes, um, they have digestive enzymes, so um, they have amylase, which converts um, sugars to fermentable sugars, digestible sugars, short chain molecules. Um, it uh, it just it breaks things down, just like our stomach breaks down a pizza. I was wondering, does the Venus ones leave some carcass, right? These guys will leave some carcass. Uh, they all end up leaving carcasses to a certain degree. It, it's not like battery acid or you know hydrochloric acid or piranha acid. If don't don't Google that one. Oof. Um, it uh, it doesn't melt everything away. It just strips out what it needs in order to grow and then the rest of it's just a husk. Yeah. So that's why you know I, I also mentioned they only have so much 
enzymes that they can utilize before they're spent and then it dies off and a new leaf comes out. There's only so much room in these plants for the bugs to fill up before it's completely full and it's now useless and it dies off. Um, do all these genuses have a common ancestor or did carnivorousness evolve separately? Good question. Um, that's one of those things is a hotly debated subject within this particular field is where did they originate from and was it one species or because they're on practically every continent did they develop this adaptation independently? Um, they're the best that they can guess is um, Dionea, or the Venus flytrap, or Drosera, the sundews, were possibly the first. And there's theories that there is a common ancestry to it. And that's actually something that, when I was living in Los Angeles many moons ago, that's something that I tried to prove. Um, I did um, crossbreeding experiments between the two genuses. And the farthest I got, which is, it's hard to get there as a home scientist, let alone in a lab, um, it's hard to get to the point where you'll actually get seed. I was able to get seed, but it wasn't viable. And that's the key. If we're able to cross-pollinate the two genuses of sundew and Venus flytrap and have it germinate, then it will prove definitively common ancestry. Because we can't, we haven't through fossil, um, fossil examples of this stuff been able to determine what is actually the first. So, that answer your question. So there isn't a lot of fossil record? Uh, I, from what I remember, there is, but there's not enough where it's definitive of like, this is, this is the first, or they all originated in this country, in this region, and then they spread out from there. You know, as far as we can tell, they're just everywhere. And we don't quite know the exact origins of them. So they're like crabs? or um, uh, occupy. Yeah. Different types. Uh, Boudicca is a recent one that they just developed. It's an underground pitcher plant. And they, they stumbled across this thing, I think in uh, somewhere in South America. And they thought that it had gotten buried somehow. You know, rains came and wash soil over, but they dug, and they dug all around, and they kept finding more and more pitchers. So it's the only subterranean Nepenthes that's out there. Uh, uh, Microphilia, it's got beautiful ribs there. Attenbergi, named after David Attenborough. That is currently the, not, that's not David Attenborough, <laughs> right? That was, uh, some dude for scale. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> that is the world's largest species of Nepenthes, and it's also <coughs> the largest species of carnivorous plants. Um, uh, Ventricosa red in the upper right, that one you'll find, that's, that's a common one that you'll find at Home Depot. Um, and then um, uh, Spectrobilis in the bottom right, just this beautiful variegated green and red. Nepenthes flowers. Uh, floral dimorphism. Uh, there's some species of plants that have distinct male and female plants that are found through the flowers. Uh, a lot of plants, you know, it has both of the sexes contained within one flower. Uh, Nepenthes, you need a male and you need a female plant. Kiwi, hops, pot, those are all dimorphic flowers. There are distinct male and female plants. So, once again, on the stocks, so they don't get eaten. Darlington Tonya, California. Guess where that one's from? <laughs> it's not Texas. Uh, uh, that's the cobra lily. 
and Saracenia trumpet pitchers. These are two separate, uh, but I combine them because they're, they're fairly similar. Uh, once again, pitfall mechanism, but they have features of lobster pot, which is downward facing hairs. So the bugs will go up, and in this particular one, it has uh, translucent cells at the top that act as, words, as windows. And so ants will crawl up it and be like, oh, I can get out there. Keep going, keep going, they get up there and, hey, man, these things are floating. What's down there? They'll tremble down here, and the downward facing hairs, they'll slip and slide on it and get further down, but because they're downward facing, they can't go back up the other way. And they just stockpile and get more and more and more and rot and uh, feed plant uh, and eventually literally the, these things can be this tall and they will be completely filled to the brim with bugs it's amazing how efficient they are um, <clears throat> so this is the this is Darnus antonia the cobra lily this is a saracenia and then this is right is another type of saracenia tr trumpet pitcher Types, Tonia californica only is in California, Northern California, very small pockets and uh, Oregon. And that's the only place it occurs. It's a, a, a monotypic, uh, meaning there's only one variety of it. Um, and there's really only two cultivars of it. It's a, a red one and then a green one. Uh, and then Saracenia, uh, to the right here, that's the uh, American trumpet pitcher. Uh, it's found throughout America, and we have them in Ohio. Supposedly, um, uh, Poldum Arboretum has some Saracenia. I haven't been able to locate them, but I also haven't asked them where they are. Probably help to do that. Uh, but I've been told that we have examples of wild Saracenias uh, growing in Holden uh, Arboretum. Uh, Saracenia leucophilia uh, is the white one, which I, I love that one. That snowy white is just beautiful. Uh, Flava is kind of the typical ones that you'll see. Uh, Saracenia uh, cuparilla on the bottom right. Uh, that one is another one that you'll find at Home Depot. Darlingtontonia flowers and Saracenia flowers. Absolutely stunning. Uh, and here's a good example of it. This little ball here on the stalk, when they first start to flower in the spring, it looks like fucking War of the Worlds. It's so cool. He's got these little bulbs that are just sitting there on these long stalks, and then all of a sudden they open up and unfurl into just beautiful. And when they get pollinated, the petals then drop out, and the seed pod forms in the center, and then eventually dries and cracks open, and all of the seeds fall right out onto the soil. Really a, a cool process to see. If you're a geek like me, if you're a normal human, it's pretty cool. Hmm. Cephalotus. This is this is my favorite. These things are just stunning. They're about they're about that tall. Uh, they grow in Australia. It's the only place in the world where it grows. A lot of times, it's along uh, a, a strip of coast in the sand that it grows. Um, No notes. Cool. <clears throat> and once again, just like the Nepenthes, there's these hairs that help facilitate the bugs crawling up. It made its own stairs. As it said, it's not stairway to heaven. It is another form of pitfall trap, and it produces a pool of digestive enzymes <coughs> that is there all the time, 
So the bugs come up, they eat some of that drool, and plunk, right into the pool. Go for uh, one last swim. <clears throat> and uh, you'll notice that, like Nepenthes, like Saracenia, uh, and like uh, Darlington Honia, it's got a lid on there. Why do you guys think it's got lids? What? What? Slam shut like a Venus flytrap? No. Keep the, stuff. Keep the rain out. Keep the rain out. Bingo. If you're going to only have so much digestive enzyme per leaf, you don't want that getting watered down. So they protect it with leaves. Oh, and it's again, it's a, it's a monotypic genus. There's only one type. Flowers, very long stalks, very small flower buds. This is one that you need gibberellic acid for. They are, uh, if you don't get fresh seed for that particular variety, uh, and you don't have gibberellic acid, they're very hard to germinate. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's highly sought after for collectors. I don't know what it is about plant collectors. They always go for rare, which is obvious, but hard to grow and slow growing. There's a lot of people that grow um, Lupiforia Williamsi, or Williamsi, which is peyote. In order to get usable peyote, it's going to take you 10 to 15 years to grow this thing indoors to be able to get any mescaline out of it. But plant collectors go gaga over it. Same with cephalotis. It, it takes, that's probably a good eight years old, and that's a full size plant there. Uh, they just, they grow so slow, but that's what attracts collectors, I guess. Utricularia. I don't know why I'm tired. Feel good? Getting close? I'll speed yeah. it up. Okay. Uh, bladder warts. <clears throat> uh, this is a, both aquatic and terrestrial uh, carnivorous plant. There's 223 species of this guy on every continent except for Antarctica. It's a bladder trap mechanism, which basically it has these traps with the trigger hairs inside, once again, a lobster pot type uh, feature of downward facing hairs, aquatic bones, comes up, tickles the hairs, the trap, convex, bug comes up, tickles the hair, in one one hundredth of a second. Toot, opens up. It sucks in water at the force of 600 G's and sucks that bug right in. And then, once the pressure is equalized, the trap folds down, thus locking its prey inside. This is a video of it. Here's the bug. Ready, real time. Hey, Frank, Frank, you out there? Uh, guys, I'm stuck. Is that a bug? That's a, that's a little, little aquatic bug. That's real time. Here it is, slow motion. And then front angle. The veil opens, pressure equalizes. Back down, locks them in. 223 species, beautiful different flowers, shooting past this. So, what can you do? As a home grower, as your average Mensa member, what can you do? If you want to grow, buy from ethical sources, buy from people that care about the plants that they're growing care about educating people. Uh, California carnivores is the best source in my opinion. They have the largest collection of carnivorous plants in the world. They're in uh, Santa Rosa, California. They have greenhouses that you can go and check out. Um, they do a lot of conservation. They do a lot of work trying to get laws passed. They're, they just, they're wonderful people. You can support the ICPS, International Carnivorous Plant Society. With the membership, it goes to help conservation, it goes to help education, and you'll also get a cool newsletter once a quarter uh, with really, really geeky stuff 
in there. Um, a lot of scientific studies, a lot of new uh, species that are discovered are first published in, in there. Um, you can join local carnivorous plant groups, Northeast Carnivorous Plant Society here in Ohio. Uh, you can also take action to help the environment and educate others. And then, how to grow. <clears throat> uh, light's important. Um, once again, plants will get leggy, they'll get light green, they won't have some beautiful, you know, whether it's red or dark, dark green or the variegation really just popping. Uh, if that happens, you're not giving them up enough light. Uh, majority of them live in high humidity environments. So how you do that at home? Put it in a plant filled with water. Uh, this is one thing that I used to do. I had the individual species, you know, just a little tub in there, one of those tubs, and put the water in there. It keeps the humidity a little higher, but it also keeps the substrate wet because a lot of these guys, they live in rainforests, bogs, etc. So they like their feet wet, but a lot of them don't like their feet dry. Um, this is a cool vivarium that somebody built out of just a old um, uh, fish tank. So they got the lights up here, this thing flops up, you can throw bugs in there like I did, have sadistic fun. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> water is the number one killer of these guys. Because they live in such nutrient deficient places, uh, tap water kills them like that. If you're growing at home, you need RO water, reverse osmosis water. Um, don't use well water. Rain water is great. Go out there, collect rain water, use that. Um, because they're nutrient deficient soils, they are extremely sensitive to chemicals. Chlorine, um, lead, uh, minerals, it just it overwhelms their system because they're not used to that pollution air. So that's one of the most, that's the, that's the thing that I tell everybody is they want to learn about growing carnivorous plants at home. Number one thing, reverse osmosis water. Because if you don't do that, you're going to kill them pretty quick. You don't need to feed them bugs. Uh, it's a secondary adaptation. It helps. You, can, um, you don't want to feed them bugs. There's uh, os osmocot pills. Um, they're about this big. They're little round pearl balls. And they're a fertilizer. You can get them at carnivorous plant stores. And you just slap one into the, in one, in one of the pitchers. And it gives it a small enough boost of NPK for growth. Uh, and it simulates having a bug in there without actually overwhelming it with artificial chemicals. And that is my speech. Um, any questions before I sit down? Okay, you were first. Uh, which species would you recommend to control fungus gnats? Fungus gnats. Um, uh, Pinguicula is fantastic. You want something that's going to have small hairs that will catch the small bugs. Um, some of the, the pygmy drosteras that I showed you that were about that big. Those are great too, but being wicula is going to be your, your, your main killer. That you can get some large leaves on there, and it's like having a piece of fly paper out there. It'll just attract the gnats to do that. But uh, if you've got fungus gnats, um, take hydrogen peroxide, pour it on the soil, wait about 30 seconds, flush with water. Not only does hydrogen peroxide kill the, uh, the larvae, it also breaks down into oxygen, which feeds the roots. So it's a win-win, and it doesn't harm the plant because it breaks down the water and oxygen, so it activates the So I would recommend that before going to the fungus plant route, because fungus gnats, once they take over, they're okay. Okay. Now, what causes a uh, carnivorous plant to grow anywhere? For example, um, you mentioned the Darlingtonia. Um, Californica. Mm -hmm. uh, you said it only grows in California, of course. But why? And then you Where? said you said another one grows only in Australia. Mm -hmm. Why are these place, plants so place specific? What is Where in they those evolved? environments that? That's where they evolved. 
That's where they. But if you take them, can you grow them someplace else? Yes. Um, oh, okay. It, you can. Um, they don't become like an invasive species, you know, like kutsu or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can take it and then grow it home. Like you can grow Darling Tintonia in your house, okay. um, and doesn't have to be in California. But some of the <coughs> other species, like some of the Nepenthes, the pitcher plants, especially the highland ones. I think the highland ones. I'm just like six stars get and confused. One of them, whether it's the highland or the lowland, needs relatively high humidity. So unless you've got a small greenhouse that you can put it in, it's not going to do the best. Yeah. So you have to, for some of them, you have to replicate the environment to a certain extent, whether it's with water or humidity or specialized food, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Well, kidding aside, do any of these have serious medical uses? Yes. Yes. Um, I can't remember what. But it has been explored for medicinal uses. Um, in particular, the, I believe it's Drosera is the one that they found the most medical benefits. Um, also, some uh, indigenous tribes will eat Nepenthes pods. They'll put rice in there and cook it up, and then the pod itself is the character. So you know how like you can do grape leaves and wrap the the rice in that and eat the grape leaves. Same thing. It's all it is is just a modified leaf. So it eats food and you eat what you eat. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you for having me.